Um, I want to talk to you about the last day. I'm not talking about the last days. This is not the pastor to teach you about the last days. Uh, there are people who are very gifted in that and in the book of Revelation, and I'm not that is okay. Rod is. He's very gifted in that, but I'm not. So I want to talk about last days because we already know we're in that, right? But I want to talk to you about the last day because we're in the last day of 2017. And I want to talk to you um, just about what that actually means as regarding indecision. Indecision is not a very fun place to be, is it? We'll talk about that in a minute, but I want to just uh, show you a couple of new, because we got a lot of new stuff in the last week, right? You guys have gotten um, lots of trash piled out at your curb since last Sunday, right? Probably burnt a lot of trash, probably threw away a lot of things, but you got a lot of new things, and if you have children, you got even more new things, and I just want to show you, because there's a feeling that comes with something new, right? Like, if it's a good thing, a good new thing, there's a feeling that comes with it. Like, for instance, look at this. Um, a new car. Now, don't think about the payment. I'm not talking about that. But, like, think about if you ever had a brand new car, like, not a used car, a brand new car, like, off the lot. And when you open that door for months, isn't that just a good smell that hits you in the face? And, and you hear cha-ching when you open the door, but you smell something that goes, ah, oh, man, this just feels good, doesn't it? Like, driving around and, and you smell that new car smell. I'm telling you, that stuff is intoxicating. Look at this one. This is one of my favorite new things in the world. Specifically, Jif, because Jif, number one, is the best. Number two, it always has a little bit of a shine on the top of it. And that peanut butter is never the same after your knife hits it the first time, right? So I like to just kind of almost make it a ceremony when I open it. Like you, you open it and you just kind of stand there and go, oh. It's beautiful. Like, it's the most perfect, smooth surface. It's, you know what I'm talking about, especially if you're a mom and you make a lot of sandwiches in your lifetime. And that moment only comes every few months, so it's a blessing when you get to see it. But you know what it is, and we'll talk about some other new things later on, but the new, it, it is, it's cool to have the new thing, the smell or, or the sight or the taste of something new. But really, when we open up something and it's new, it's the potential of that thing that's making us excited, Right? That word potential means something that can develop or become actual. So, for instance, if you're a parent, you have children, you see the potential in them of who they're going to be one day, right? You know, when you're raising little kids, every once in a while you can catch a look of their face and you think, oh my gosh, I just saw like a snapshot of what she's going to look like when she's an adult. Or, ooh, I, like Walker got a big boy haircut, and I keep thinking, I'm looking at him as a 15-year-old. Like, it, it just a snapshot. I can see who they're going to be. Or maybe Christmas morning, if you were at the grandparents, and you opened up a present. The kids opened up the present from a grandparents. You immediately saw the potential of a nightmare in that present. <laughs> our moment was when three of our boys got these air pump air guns. There's two, because one isn't enough in every box, and in every box has about three million round foam circles like this. And we have a six and two, five, well, actually seven and two five-year-olds in just a few days. So that means that between the three of them, there are 24 million balls. It's the worst. And so we open it up, and I'm like, really? Were we that terrible of kids that you had to get our kids this for Christmas? Potential. I see what's going to happen with this, right? How about a new job? You don't just take a job and say, I'm entering this job no matter what level you enter that job at, and I'm going to camp out here for the rest of my life. You take a job because you see the potential in being able to climb to where you need to go next, right? How about a new house? Lori and Seth just got a new house. It's a, a house that they were going to grow in for years, and there's lots of renovations they're going to do. So we're walking through it, and Lori will say, well, the kitchen's going to be different when we do this because she's not moving into it with this is how it's always going to be. She's moving into it with this is the potential we're going to have for years to come. Are you following me? How about potential in this? Look at this. How do you feel when you look at this calendar? Whew. All the feels, right? Excited. Um, some people will look at that and go, oh my gosh, it's another 365 days we've got to get through. Seriously, I've been there. I get it. You know, when you're looking at, oh my goodness. And especially when you're a kid and you're like, it's seriously 11 months till Christmas again. Like, we have to wait that long to get our tree put back up again. I'm already dreading taking mine down. But you know what? You know what God sees when he looks at this? Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you. 
says the Lord, plans to give you a hope and a future. So when he looks at this, he doesn't feel overwhelmed and think deadlines and bills and sinking and debt and financial hardship and family and all this. He thinks, I see what I have planned for you. I see the potential in every one of those 365 days. Are you glad that what he sees is different than what we see? So, you know, indecision, like I said earlier, is a, it's not a good place to be. It's not a, a place where you can flourish and grow in your life. Look at this in James 1, um, in the Holman Bible. It says, now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives to all generously and without criticizing. I love that part. He never, gets, he never goes, really, are you still asking me about this? How many times have I told you, right? It will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting, for the doubter is like the surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. An indecisive man is unstable in all his ways. Now, it doesn't say God's not going to give anything to somebody who's indecisive. God gave the same thing to all of us. But an indecisive person can't make a decision, do I want this or do I not? Right? An indecisive person says, I'm uncomfortable, but I don't think I'm uncomfortable enough to actually get up and do something about it. It's indecision. I'm kind of in the middle of it, right? How miserable actually am I, right? Have you ever been on a, on a cruise ship or a deep sea fishing trip and the water is choppy and how the boat moves? There is no sick like seasick. You know what I'm saying? It's miserable. And I've never gotten seasick on a cruise, but like on those dinner boats, you know, and like whatever. I I can't. I don't want to eat my dinner if the boat's doing this. I just don't. It's not a good feeling. You know why? Because your equilibrium is messed up. And your body's going, I don't know if I'm here. I don't know if I'm there. I don't know if I'm here. I don't know if I'm there. That is no way for our bodies to have to live long term. That's no way for our emotions to have to live. That's not a pleasant place to be. You know, hey, listen, young people. You know how you become a wise person? By seeking wisdom. And listen, by making mistakes. That's okay. It's okay. I'm speaking to you, especially in your 20s. If you feel like you've blown it already, you haven't. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to blow it. And next time, you're going to be wiser. And you're going to be stronger. And that's how we grow. And that's how we deepen. We listen to wisdom of people who are older than us and made those mistakes, of course. But some things you just can't learn until you do it yourself. Right? Especially if you're hard-headed. So, you know... Um, you might be in the same place today, emotionally, in the situation that you were in as you were last year when we had our pajamas on on a Sunday morning. And you might be in the same place that you were in in 2003 in in the situation. That sounds like a really long time ago, doesn't it? But you know what? That's how it happens when we live in indecision. Days turn into months, months turn into years. And before we know it, we let that situation rule our life and we never picked what we wanted to do with it. It's a yucky place to be. See, Job 22, 28 says, you will decide and decree a thing, and it will be established for you. And the light of God's favor will shine upon your ways. It doesn't say it's just going to be established for you. We have to make a decision. Everybody said decision. You ever been with somebody who goes to, like, I don't know, Chick-fil-A, right? I mean, you know the combos by heart. And you go to Chick-fil-A, and you pull. This is what Rod does, by the way, at Chick-fil-A. We pull up into the drive-thru. This is a good thing. We pull up into the drive-thru, and he'll say to the kids, know what you want. You know what I'm talking about? Because some people in our family, she ain't in here, but some people in our family will be like, guys, I don't know. Like, I'm kind of feeling, I don't know. Like, if I want, he goes, Abby, they always, they always either have nuggets or a sandwich. It's not that hard. Just pick. I mean, you know what you want. I don't know if I want Dr. Pepper or lemonade. That was all I was trying to say. You're having having Dr. Pepper. She's having Dr. Pepper, Right? Listen, you, you show me someone that is um, constantly in emotional stress and strain. I'm telling you, almost, I'm not saying every time, but almost every time you're looking at a person who has had other people make those decisions for them and they're miserable. You were created to be a decision maker. You may feel like it's hard for you to make decisions. You struggle. That's okay. God has a grace for you in making decisions. But you weren't made to be at the mercy of everybody else's decision. He created you with the ability to choose. He created you. Even if the circumstance is completely not fair and slammed the door in your face and you've been hurt and you've been wrong, you have the ability to choose victory. It's hard. That's a hard truth when your life sucks. Can I say that? I just did. But when, it, when it's bad, it's hard to admit, I did not choose this and I'm stuck here. But you know what? I don't have to live here anymore. Right? 
So I'm going to give you four stories today, briefly, that um, show people who said, today is the last day. Today's the last day. Now, I'm not telling you, you're going to say, today's the last day, and you're going to change your mind, you're going to go home, and all your finances were fixed, and your children have halos on their heads all of a sudden, and your marriage just fell into place and everything. But I'm telling you that just like Job 22, 28 says, the first thing that has to happen is I have to make a decision. I can't live in indecision anymore. I've got to make a decision, okay? So here's four examples of people who made decisions. Ready? Number one, here's one thing you're going to learn from this one. When God speaks, you have a decision to make. Just because he speaks it doesn't mean I choose it. That's hard. First Kings 17 says, but after the brook dried up, there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. And then the Lord said to Elijah, go live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So he went to Zarephath and he arrived at the gates of the village and saw a widow gathering sticks. And he asked her, would you please bring me a little water in a cup? And as she was going to get it, he called to her, bring me a bite of bread too. And then she said, I swear by the Lord your God, I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. And I only have a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal and then my son and I will die. Well, that stinks. But then Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Just go ahead and do what you said, but make me a little bread first. Typical preacher. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord God of Israel says. There will always be flour and oil left in the containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. So she did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and oil left in the containers just as the Lord promised through Elijah. Now listen, clearly verse 9 says that the Lord had already instructed her to feed Elijah. Look at this. Go and live in the village of Zarephath. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. But when Elijah got there, she was making a meal for her and her son to have their last meal. Right? So just because God says it doesn't mean I'm going to do it. I have to choose it. He's not going to force it on me. I have to make a decision. Yes, Lord, I want what you want for my life. Yes, Lord, I will obey you even though this doesn't make any sense. Right? Right? So she wasn't thinking, listen, you can tell a woman what to do. (laughs) That don't mean she's going to do it. And especially when it comes to her children. So you're telling me, who do you think you, who said that? That you're going to tell me to make you something to eat when my son is hungry. Right? She didn't do it. But guess what? God knows your heart. And even when you make the wrong decision, at least you've made a decision. And he has a mercy for your wrong decision. Listen to this. Revelation 3.16 says, But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. This is pretty bold. It's kind of offensive, right? Thanks, Jesus. In the Message Bible, it says, I know you inside and out and find little to my liking. You ever felt that way about somebody in your life? Oh, I know you. I don't like you at all. You're not cold, you're not hot, far better, to be cold, far better to be cold or hot. You're stale, you're stagnant, you make me want to vomit. Now, I don't think that that necessarily means you literally make me sick. I don't think God is saying that, but I do think it's that thing when you're, you know, especially when you're a parent, you know that your kids can do better. You know that they're not pushing themselves hard enough and you know that they've settled and they've camped out where they are or they're letting somebody take advantage of them and it nauseates you. You're like, come on, you're, you're better than that. You've got my blood flowing through your veins. I know what you're made of. You're a conqueror, right? So I think that's what he's saying. It's like, look, you're not giving me anything to work with here. You've got to make a decision. Make the wrong decision and my mercy will prevail. Make the right decision and we'll walk together. Whatever it is, just make a decision, right? You know, that's what God's mercy is for. Sometimes we live in this um, holding pattern of fear and we don't ever make a decision. And like I said before, we know it, decades have gone by and we didn't make a decision because we're afraid we're going to fail. You're looking at a girl who is constantly walking out the fear of failure with my Jesus. I hated being, I hate being wrong. I didn't hate it. I hate it now. 
being wrong. I remember hearing the bus come when I was a kid. This is the truth. And I could hear the, you know, the air brakes on the bus coming down the road to pick me up, and my stomach would hurt because I would think, oh, my gosh, I'm going to get to school, and I'm not going to know everything. I'm going to not get an answer right. I'm going to do bad on a test. You, you know what I'm saying? If you're that achieving, like, driven kind of personality, it's hard to admit failure, right? But you know what? That's what God's mercy is for, y'all. He wouldn't have created it if we didn't need it. Look, Lamentations 3 says, The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. So that widow decided, after she obeyed what the Lord said and made the food, right? She had decided, today is the last day I will neglect God's prompting. From now on, because he was patient with me and he had mercy because I disobeyed him, he still had mercy on me. I know now that what he says is true. I'm not going to neglect this prompting anymore. If you're feeling it, you need to go for it. I'll just look at Seth and he shook his head. I'm like, do you want me to use the handheld? You want me to keep going? Okay. (laughs) Number two. Here we go. Number two. Making a decision puts you ahead. Okay? Pretty obvious. Luke 19, Jesus entered Jericho. Kias. And he was the chief tax collector in the region, and he became very rich. And he tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. He ran ahead by the side of the road. All right. I guess I'm using Lori's now. So Jesus was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, quickly come down. I'm going to be a guest in your house today. Are you kidding me? Jesus took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner. Because that's what people do. Okay? They grumble when somebody else gets the spotlight. Somebody who doesn't deserve it gets the spotlight. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor Lord. If I've cheated people on their taxes, I give them back four times as much. And Jesus responded, salvation has come to this house today. For this man has shown himself a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who were lost. Okay. Zacchaeus knew he had three disadvantages working against him. Number one, it says he was a chief tax collector. Number two, he was a notorious sinner. And number three, he was short. Nothing wrong with it. So he had all of these disadvantages if he wanted to see Jesus that day. Right? There was always a crowd around Jesus. He wasn't in the inner circle. He wasn't one of those guys that could just walk his way up through the middle of the crowd. Plus, he was short. So he had a disadvantage, a a physical disadvantage. But you know what? For whatever reason it was, Zacchaeus had made the decision, today is the last day I'm letting what was handed to me or even the path I've chosen dictate my future. That's it. This is the last day. I get it that I have cheated and I've lied my way through my life. I get it that I'm short. I don't even have the physical advantage I need to get in there to where Jesus is. But watch me because it's not going to stop me. Right? So he had made a decision that put him, listen, ahead. It said that Jesus' crowd was coming. Zacchaeus had already made the decision and went ahead of Jesus and climbed up in the tree to wait. So, you know, being prideful or uh, arrogant and saying, I'm not short. I'm not short. I'm not, I'm not a tax collector. I'm not a sinner. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, would have cheated him of an eagle eye view of what Jesus was about to do. He knew his shortcomings, listen, and he didn't expect a free pass because of them. So in Roman times, basically, this is how the tax collecting thing worked. The, the people who were tax collectors by trade would bid in a city for the job to be like the the Lord, so to speak, of that tax reign. So they would bid. So these men would say, well, I can raise such and such for Rome in Jerusalem. Well, I can raise such and such. And they would bid. And whoever got the highest bid would be the chief tax collector in that area. And they were, you talk about hated. This is why they were hated. They would bid to, to raise a certain amount for Rome. And then whatever they made over that, they got to put in their pocket and keep. So they cheated and swindled already bleeding people, Right? And got whatever, that's why he was hated. It wasn't just like how we don't like the IRS, y'all. And that's a whole other sermon. But I'm talking about this was just dirty, ugly robbery. So he was hated. But you know what? He he thought, if I'm ever going to get ahead of my reputation, i got to get ahead of this crowd. i got to get out in front of this. You know what? Sometimes it takes us dealing with something head on. 
and realizing I have been wrong. I repent to you. I'm sorry for what I have done to you. Anything I can physically do in my power to make this up to you, I will do it. But you know what? We have to swallow a lot of pride to get to that point. Young people, listen to me. Learn it now. It gets harder the older you get, the more set in your ways that you get. So I imagine that, you know, it says that people were talking about Zacchaeus behind his back. And they were, well, did you see Zacchaeus? Who does he think he is? A little guy thinks he's something, right? Cocky little thing, stole everything I have, eaten with Jesus. Who does he think he is? You know what? Zacchaeus didn't care at that point. He said, I don't care how much they talk about me behind my back. I have to start over at some point. I'm going to face it today. Now look at this. Here's, this is actually called the Zacchaeus tree. And um, it's a tree in that area. People do believe this is the tree that Zacchaeus climbed. But this is a sycamore fig tree. And, you know, here he is, like, running. There ain't little low branches on the ground, y'all. Dude had to work to get up that climb, right? I mean, that's a, that's a pretty steep climb for a tall guy. But here's Zacchaeus with a physical disadvantage climbing up this tree. Hey, what's your tree? It's not going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it. You have to decide to climb the tree. What tree do you need to climb? You know what? Some of you today, I'm about to start screaming at the top of my lungs. Some of you might have to decide, today's the day I've decided I'm going to go back to school at 52. Today's the day that I'm going to, I'm going to start talking to my family about making a career change because I'm miserable where I am. It's okay. Climb your tree. Everybody say, I'm going to climb my tree. So Zacchaeus had decided, this is the last day I let my disadvantage and regret rule my life. Number three, making a decision pulls you out of isolation. Luke 8 says, a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe and immediately the bleeding stopped. It's a very familiar story if you come to church here. Who touched me, Jesus asked. Everyone denied it and Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said, someone deliberately touched me, for I felt healing power go out of me. And when the woman realized she couldn't stay hidden anymore, she began to tremble, fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had immediately been healed. And he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. So we talk a lot about this story, right? We know the woman was bleeding with some kind of of hemorrhage for 12 years. We know that it was something related to her monthly cycle. And so this is the deal. Under, under Levitical law, she was ceremonially unclean for seven days, period. If you, if you have a cycle, you're under seven days, you're unclean. Now, you know what that means? Listen to this. Anything she touches is unclean. Anything that she lies down on or sits on is ceremonially unclean. Anyone who touches her is ceremonially unclean. Anyone who sits down or lies down on anything she has sat or lied down on is ceremonially unclean. So that's just for like an inconvenient seven-day period in everybody's life, right? Well, here's this. She's been here for 12 years. So that tells me that most likely she's alone because how can she live with relatives? How can she have a husband? How can she have children? How can they have dinner, anything, if she's ceremonially unclean? All of this time, she's alone. So not only is she physically hemorrhaging, dying, has spent everything she has, she's alone. She's isolated. She's had to be. So for whatever reason, she heard Jesus was coming to town. I don't know how word spread back then, but I imagine it was just mouth to mouth and just running wide open, right? Jesus is coming. And however she heard he's coming, she said, today is the last day I do this alone. This is it. And I imagine that she was obviously emotionally and physically just drained. And she gets there to the crowd. She realizes this is not just, oh, I'm sick. I don't feel good. I got to push through the crowd. She realizes that what she's doing is punishable by death. This is, this is legit, y'all. This is as real as it gets for her. But she's, you know what? Have you ever been that desperate where you go, I'm done? Like at this point, heaven sounds better. So if I can't get a miracle, just take me on. You know what I'm talking about? This is where she was at. She gets to the crowd. She sees the crowd. She realizes this is it. I imagine she's shaking out of fear. Like, is this where it's going to end? Right here. But I believe that that sweet little woman, and I can't wait to watch this in heaven one day. I believe that as she's walking the miles or whatever it took to her to get there, and she gets to the edge, I believe she was going, just touch his robe. Just touch his robe. Just touch his robe. Just touch his robe. That's all I have to do is touch his robe. What do you need to be telling yourself? God is for me. God is for me. 
I can do this. Just one more day. Just one more day. His grace is going to come. His grace is going to come. He is for me. He is in my corner. What is it that she had to keep telling herself even though her body was going, you're going to die. You're going to die, and you're going to be embarrassed about it at that. You're going to be shamed, and you're going to be treated like you're less than human because you're unclean. But you know what? Her purpose pushed her further than that fear was going to keep her. My favorite part is verse 46. Jesus said, someone deliberately touched me. Because, you know, here's the crowd. Hey, Jesus said, somebody touched me. Power just went out of me. And I believe everybody was like, well, it's probably John because he's your buddy and all. Right? Jesus, everybody's touching you. No, somebody deliberately touched me. You know what? Listen to this. It's the deliberate that gives you access to the intangible. Period. It's what you do deliberately. Yes, God wants to bless you. Yes, God wants things to effortlessly happen for you. But we know that faith without works is dead. So if I don't deliberately put my feet on the floor, I'm not going to access the intangible. This is a faith walk, as in verb, as in i got to keep moving. I'm going to say it one more time. The deliberate gives you access to the intangible. What are you deliberately doing to say this is the last day? Sure, it's risky. It's risky, right? But there is something deep in you that wants to touch the hem of his garment. And let me tell you something, you were made to push through the crowd. You were made to climb trees and push through the crowd. You weren't made to be lost in the crowd. You're not just another face to him. I don't care how many people are in your family and how lost you felt in the rank of the birth order. You were made to push through the crowd. So push through it. Number four, this is the last one. Making a decision gives me a day one again. The ushers are going to pass out... Um, something to you I just want you to hold. It's just a simple crayon. Everybody take one out of the box and just keep it with you. Um, you ever played any kind of board game with a little kid? I'm talking about like a little kid, like, you know, four, five, six, like candy or shoots and ladders. Let's use shoots and ladders, for instance. So shoots and ladders, you know, you like spin the little thing and then it says move four. So you might move four and move all that you can get on a ladder that takes you all the way up almost to the top of the game, Right? Or you could be like halfway through the game and hit the slide and the shoot, and you have to go all the way back to the beginning. That's a real bad game to play if you've got a kid like Walker. It never ends well. It never, you know, when Jesus flipped the tables over in rage, that's how my kid plays shoots and ladders. Because he'll get, if he gets four or five steps and he realizes that he slid down, every time he will say something like this, Mom, let's just start over. Let's just start over. Something's not right. We, we just, let's start over. That's not very fun, right? Let's start over, Right? Listen to me, you have the ability, the right at any point in your story to go, wait, let's start over. I'm losing, and I don't lose. So let's start over, Lord. I need that new mercy right now, right? It's not over till you win, guys. So you got to cram, look at this picture. Do you remember this feeling? If your parents made enough money for you to be able to get the 64 count real Special, hello, oh my gosh, make it stop. (laughs) If you had the real Crayola brand crayons, you were a uh, favored child, right? You got Rose Art crayons today, just saying. But still, do you remember you get them and you opened it up? And I know some of you are guys, I didn't color nothing, I hated coloring, but you remember opening it up and just smelling it? And being like, look how flat it is. It's, they're all the same size. Oh, they're perfect. Gave Walker some a couple weeks ago. He dumped the whole thing out on the floor in one second. Broke my heart in half. Because it needs to stay organized, right? And clean and smooth. Guess what? That's not what crayons are for. You know... Abby, our daughter Abby is an artist, and uh, she's a really good budding artist. Like, she's really getting her, finding her bearings of her Christmas. She asked for an art table, and she asked for all the art things. Like, no, don't give her that little cheap watercolor stuff anymore. It's got to be, like, Bob Ross oil and certain kind of brush, and I need a scraper. and any, So, I mean, tons of art supplies. So, after she's done, she takes it all down to her room, and she organizes it. And I mean, like, puts everything in its, like, category and the drawers. And, I mean, everything's organized. She probably spent an hour and a half, I mean, like, working on organizing her art supplies. And that kid, 
at this moment has an overflowing trash can in her bathroom with soda cans. You know what I'm saying? So this is like, this is, she's passionate about this. So she organizes it, gets it ready, and then you could just see her brain exploding with creativity. I'm going to paint this, and then I'm going to paint this, and then I'm going to paint this. And she went to work, and we didn't see her for almost the rest of the day. Like she's just down, paint, like brush to canvas. I just want to brag on her and show you some of um, her art that she's done. Maybe. This is a house that she drew. I think it's great. She actually framed that for me for Christmas. But then Christmas night, she drew these, or painted these, rather. Isn't that great? That kid ain't had a lick of art lesson in her life. And as passionate as she was about getting all of this organized, she knew there has to come a moment when I get my hands dirty, when I mess my brush up, when I actually probably ruin a canvas and make mistakes, and I, oh, I shouldn't have done that tree that color. I need to figure out how to, she told me on that one with the yellow background, she said, I messed up the background so bad, I thought I'm going to have to throw it away, but then I repainted the background, and I did a sunrise instead of whatever she was going to do, because that's how her artist brain is thinking, how can I fix it? Let me tell you something. The gifts that God put inside of you were not made to just stay in the boxes and lined up neatly on the desk. You're supposed to make mistakes with it. You're supposed to fail. You're supposed to make a big mess. You're supposed to explode with creativity. You are here to bring God colors to this world. That's what you're here to do. You know, the next Bible story is your story. And in just a few hours, we're going to count backwards and the ball's going to drop. And thank God, 2017 is just going to be a memory. Right? But the truth is, you can have a New Year's Day on January 1 or August 10th or November 12th. Whenever it is that you need to start the game over, you get to start over because his mercy is new for you every day. So what decision will you make today? There's potential in every decision that you make. So look at your crayon. What will you do with it? Will you throw it aside? Will you forget about it in the bottom of your purse? Will you think it's silly and toss it out like other dreams that you thought were silly? It's not about the crayon, y'all. It's about what the crayons represent. Look at your crayon again. Your ability to draw a yellow sunshine on a blank piece of paper and create sunshine in someone else's life by deciding to bless them. Your ability to take a red crayon and draw a heart, filling it in with ruby redness is your choice to stamp love on the people under your roof who frustrate you. Your ability to draw a blue sky or an orange flower or green grass signals to someone in your life that spring is on the way. I'm not just talking about crayons. You get what I'm saying, right? Someone is needing your pink and you need their gray to complete your picture. Someone needs your burgundy. Let them give you their brown. It's not about the crayons. It's about what you do with the crayons. It's about taking what's in your hand and making a decision. 2018 is a blank canvas in front of you. 365 opportunities to use the tools that God has given you to color your world or 365 chances to put your crayon away and keep it sharp. And for what? So you can stay free of making mistakes? So your family doesn't ridicule you and say you're frivolous? 53 Sundays ago, you had an unseen crayon in your hand, and it was the first day of a new year. We wore pajamas, we worshiped, and we prayed, and we wondered what the next 365 days would hold. You heard 53 sermons from this stage since then. 53 times we've prayed for you as you entered this auditorium. 53 times we've challenged you to put your feet on the floor and walk in faith. 53 Sunday mornings we've had coffee and donuts and we've hugged each other and lifted each other up. 53 times you've walked out of here with your heart stirred and you've left eager and challenged. But 53 Sundays later, how sharp is your crayon? Don't you think, look at this, when God looks at us, he sees us like this. This is, this is a container of crayons from my house. And I don't know if you can see, but they're very well loved. They're very used. They're very broken. They're very worn. There's not any sharp ones in here. There's those big, like, uh, chunky ones. There's little tiny fragments of blue ones that are worn down to the edge. You know, we see the, the worn out pieces and we think, man, I sure would like to have that 96 box instead that's all sharp and new, right? We see the broken ones in half that are barely held together by a thin wrapper. The ones who are worn, unreadable. The one that's that weird color green, that yellow that's the color of baby poop and the pale peach that no one ever wants to use. We see the one used so small it's not holdable anymore. The one that inherited glitter from some other art project a few months ago. I'm not talking about the crayons. Are you following me? That's not what God sees. He sees for all the wear and tear on us, all the I love you daddies that were written. 
the summertime flowers that those crayons have drawn. He sees the smiles on the face of a happy grandma when she receives the perfect Mother's Day card drawn by these waxy sticks of color. He notices how many times the crayons were picked up and put back in the container that held them after a long, messy day. He sees the misspelled words from chubby little fingers. He smiles when he rereads the birthday cards they wrote, and it delights him to see the joy that they brought to lonely hearts or tired teachers on a rough morning. Look at these crayons. They're well-loved, deeply used, fractured, broken, but broken colors still color. Now look at your crayon. Decide that today is the last day that your crayon will ever be this sharp. Use that dream. Don't protect it because it's pretty or avoid messing it up. Your God paints sunsets and colors and he does his most wonderful work through you. You know what it is your crayon is supposed to color. For some of you, you're going to go back to school this year. Some of you need to take a leap and change career paths. Some of you need to branch out in your personality and make new friendships. Some of you need to use your talent to bless others. Will you decide today, this is the last day my crayon will be this sharp? They're supposed to look like this. That's what they were made to do. I'm reminded of this jewel that Rod read earlier, and he had no idea this was in my notes. Isaiah 43 says, forget all that. It's nothing compared to what I'm going to do. For I'm about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Don't you see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in dry wasteland because your God is an ever-creating, ever-living, ever-mercy-giving God. You can mess your canvas up by tomorrow night and he'll help you fix it. You can break your crayon in half before the calendar even flips over and he'll say, I can still use that. Let me see it. Lord, we were so honored by your faithfulness in 2017. Forgive us for the times we kept our crayons sharp in their boxes and decided if we would use them for your glory or keep them safe in our protection. Where did you want us to use them, Lord? Remind us now. May we not be so hard-hearted that we make the same mistakes this year. Show us the places that the world around us needs the exact color we bring to the table. And may it be the desires of our hearts, like the precious Irma Brombeck said. She's in heaven, but I love this so much. She said, when I stand before God at the end of my life, I would hope that I would not have one single bit of talent left. And I could say, I used everything you gave me. Use our colors up this year, Lord. We're in a world that needs them badly. And Lord, I thank you that when we stand here 52 Sundays from now, and we're in our pajamas, and we're worshiping you and honoring you for your faithful love in 2018, that we are going to look at our crayons and say, I used it so well this year. Thank you, Father. Today's the last day of this year and of indecision. We make a decision to use what's in our hand. And if you're here today and you haven't asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior, I promise you, you did not make a decision in 2017 more important than this one. And we want to pray with you as we do every Sunday. Let's all pray this together. Jesus, I believe you came into this world. You lived a sinless life. You took my sin you took my judgment. My past is gone. My future is spotless. I call you my Lord. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today for the first time, we have a couple of resources we would love to give you in the VIP corner. We've got a gospel of John for you and a book on how to get your relationship with, with Jesus off the ground. Or maybe that was a, a recommittal for you of a new relationship. We've got resources we want to bless you with so you're not doing this by yourself. Happy New Year. Make a decision to use your crayon up this year. We're so honored to love you. We're so honored we get to walk into a brand new year with you. And I can't wait to see you next year.